Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Allen, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And the program is conducted in Southwest Ohio through the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library, and it's under the direction of Brian Powers. And today is July the 6th, and we have the distinct pleasure and honor of interviewing World War II veteran Julian Smith. Mr. Smith, thank you for doing this interview with us. You're, you're welcome. All right. Appreciate that. Well, let's start out and uh, tell us where and when you were born. I was born September 23rd, 1925 in Duncannon, Pennsylvania. Where is Duncannon in relation to some larger city I might know? Uh, Duncannon is in Prairie County, and that's about 12 miles due north of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg's the capital. All right. Uh, what were your mom and dad's names? My father's name was James M. Smith. My mother was Grace E. Smith. What was your mother's maiden name? Uh, Grace E. Watts, W-A-T-T-S, Watts. All right, when was your father born? Do you remember that? Uh, January 2nd, 1902. Your mother, you remember her birth date? Yeah, here was November 1908. Did they ever tell you how they met? They were, they were neighboring farm people, and they met on the, in the neighborhood on the neighboring farms. And was their farm in the Duncannon area? Yeah, it was in the Duncannon area in Prairie County. Did you have uh, brothers and sisters? I had one brother. His name was James M. Smith. He was four years younger than me. He was born in uh, 1929. And he passed away, I understand. Yeah, he passed away at the age of about 65 with leukemia. All right, and that was when, about 1965? I mean, 1995? Yeah, about 1995. Right. And you have a you have a sister. I have a, uh, a half sister. Her name is Joyce Yocum. That's Y O C U M. And she lives in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and she works for the federal government. She's been there her her whole career. She's still working. She works at the Pentagon. And how old's How old's Joyce? Joyce is about seventy one. Is she married? Her husband was a military career army medical. And he passed away with cancer. Uh, he was very young. Uh, I'd say about 40 years ago he passed away. He had a military funeral, a library funeral in Washington, D.C. And uh, Joyce has two sons. The youngest one is Mark. He's the funeral director in Charleston, South Carolina. The older brother is Mike. He, wor he lives in Maryland, and he works for the federal government in Washington. Okay, how about your brother James? Did he Was he married? No, he wasn't married. Right. Uh, so, did your father do anything besides farming? Yes, he was a railroader. He was, he had, his career was on the Pennsylvania Railroad, and he was a car repairman, and he built railroad cars. Interesting. And that was in Enola, Pennsylvania. Enola is directly west of, across the river from Harrisburg. As it was a, during the war, it was a very large railroad classification yard. And they, they hired uh, thousands of workers at that time. How about your mother? Did she work outside the home? Yeah, she'd done different jobs for, uh, I can't remember the company she worked for, but she, she did miscellaneous jobs. And then the last thing I remember of her, she uh, owned and operated a restaurant in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania for a number of years. <clears throat> what, was it uh, just a mom and pop restaurant, or was it? Yes, a yeah, it was a mom and pop restaurant. Okay. Then, uh, then at that time, I'll, I'll go a little further. M my parents, after 22 years, they were divorced, and they each married again. My, my mother married a, a man that was a warehouseman. His name was Harry Powden, and uh, my father married a lady. Her name was Helen Winters. And is Helen still living? No, no, all, uh, they're, all, they're all deceased. Okay. 
So uh, after you were born uh, in, in Duncannon, uh, how long did you live there with your Well, I was four years old, and we moved to Enola, Pennsylvania, that's E-N-O-L-A, directly on the west side of the Susquehanna River from Harrisburg. Where did you go to grade school? Uh, I went at a little country school, a little community called West Enola. I was there f in school four years. Well, let me ask you about that. Uh, was that a, uh, a regular schoolhouse or was that a one-room school? It, it was a one-room school with an outside, rest, an outside toilet and they had three grades. And uh, when I was in, I think it was first grade, they were going to close the school because they didn't have enough of students. And the teacher, somehow or other, held some students back so she could have her job. And no <laughs> one did anything about it. So in the long run, that helped me a little bit uh, doing when I became 18 because I'd have been in the military earlier. And uh, right. so everything had an answer. But so I was in first grade two years and I'd have graduated at age 17, but I was 18 at the beginning of my senior year because of that. All right, uh, the little one-room school uh, building, they had three classes in the same room? Yeah, three in the same room. Do you remember how many students were in that building? I'd say about 25. How did how did the building be, Was uh, how was it heated, excuse me, during the uh, winter they time? They had a, a, a little furnace that was uh, operated by wood and coal that was set in the front of the room in the one corner of the room in the front. Did that keep you warm or did you have to keep your coat on? No, it kept us warm, but we did have a, we, we did have a light jacket on sometimes. All right. How did you get to school? I had a walk and it was about a half a mile one way. I walked. And how was, how was that walk in the winter time? It was, it was, being a kid we didn't notice it. I don't remember much about it, but we survived it. Okay. In the winter time, did you have galoshes or boots that you yeah, wore? Yeah, we had boots. I put boots on. Okay. And a, a heavy coat and gloves and a hat. Uh, how much uh, how much younger was James than you? Uh, four years. Four years. So he didn't go to that school. No, no, he didn't. He went to one in uh, in Enola in town. Is that where you went after this? Yeah, yeah, we went there, and we both had a walk. Now that'd be about a mile one way. So but we had it was hilly, and we'd have a path up and down over the hill. Then, well, for a, a short distance, then we had a walk on the main road along the side of the road. What kind of a school building was that? It was a red brick, uh, it was two stories. So you didn't have to have more than one class in uh, your room? Uh, no, it was just it was just one class at, at that point in time. Each grade was separate. It started at fourth grade. Uh, at the school I went to when I started fourth grade, it was started fourth and fifth on up to sixth, seventh and eighth. And then after eighth grade, we went to the high school building, which was uh, about a, a mile away, and what, it's still in Enola. What what uh, what kind of teacher did you have there at your first school? Was that a man or a woman? A woman. About when you got to your new school, was that a man or a woman? They were men and women. That was a ver uh, different. Well, when you went to your new school there uh, in Enola, was it Enola? Yeah, Enola. Uh huh. Um, were you, were you living on the farm? No, we didn't have a farm. That was, uh, we had about an acre or an acre and a half, but we had a garden and fruit trees and shrubbery, but we didn't have, and we had chickens. We did have, we had chickens, a lot of chickens and pigs. We had three pigs. Well, tell me a bit about your, your dad's work day on, on the railroad then. Uh, what, when would his day start and end? He worked from about 7 to 3.30, something like that. And what was your school day? And that would be like 8 to eight to 3, something in that area, 8 to 3. Uh, when you were in grade school, did you have to do any help around the house? Uh, yes, I did a lot of work. I mowed grass 
And when I was young, even before 10 years old, I'd work in the garden pulling weeds and then harvesting beans and potatoes and, and anything that had to be done. I'd feed the chickens and at an early age I learned to feed the pigs, three pigs, and they became pets. <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. So, uh, then when you d finished all that, uh, when did you have time to do your schoolwork? Well, we'd do it in the evening, and uh, I'd do a lot of it at school, and uh, if I remember, very little at home, because I'd do most of it at school. L let me go back to your, your first school again. How, you had a, a coal or a wood stove to, for heat. What did you have for light? Did you have electricity in that little one-room school? Yeah, there was electricity. And I'll mention one more thing. That building is still standing there, and they turned it into a home. But now I've been in Ohio for almost 20 years, and I don't know, I haven't been back there for a few years, but I know the building the last I was there is still there, but I don't think any, at that time, I'm not sure if anybody lives in it now, but it was a, turned into a home. <clears throat> I, I like to see places uh, reused. So when, when, about what year did you get out of uh, elementary school? You mean the third grade? No, oh, you, you mean eighth, eighth, grade. eighth grade? Wait a minute, I was uh, six, six, wait a minute, I was about 14 years old. Uh, well, you were, you were born September 23 of 1925. Yes. So did you get out of uh, grade school uh, before 1940? Uh, yeah, right around 1940, because in, in September uh, of 1940, September of 43, I was 18 years old at the beginning of my senior year. Okay. And I was drafted at that time, but we'll talk about that later. Well, how many uh, how many classmates did you have when you were a senior? Just a ballpark. Uh, uh, well, we had when I graduated there were forty four. Okay, well, pretty evenly divided boys and girls. I think it was pretty pretty even. Did you play any sports in school? I, I went out for football, but <laughs> I didn't make it. <laughs> I sat in the bench and. So then I got nervous and I went to work. Okay. So where did you go to work? I, I had a paper route. It was in the country. I had 70 customers. I rode a bicycle. And it was about, the whole route was about 10 miles because it was in the country and farm, farm territory. A lot of hills up and down. And it was very interesting. And then once a month I would collect the money at that time, I put on 20 mile because I had to go into the farm building to collect. What newspaper were you delivering? It was called the Harrisburg, Harrisburg Evening News. How long did it take you? To, I had a paper route when I was a kid too, but I was in town, so mine didn't take long. How did yours take? To do that 10 mile would take several hours, about two or three hours. And, Two hours. And uh, for the newspapers, uh, did you only collect once a month? Yeah, out in the country, because it was a distance, I'd collect once a month. And oh, I had one more thing. Of all my years of doing that, I only had one customer fail me. I lost uh, on one customer. I was going to ask you that, if you ever got stiffed by anybody. Yeah, stiffed by one. <laughs> How much did you earn as a paper boy? I don't have the exact amount, but I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe $50 a month. It wasn't very much, but I could get a Coca-Cola for a nickel. Uh -huh. And there was a couple of stores on the way, and I'll add one more thing to it. I caught myself at one time getting hooked on uh, Coca-Cola and cigarettes. Cigarettes? Yeah, at a young age, I started cigarettes. When, how old were you when you started cigarettes? Well, oh no, no, maybe 16 or 17, okay. 16 or 17. You're still in high school? Yes, uh-huh. Still have your paper route? Yes, that's how I had the money, that's how I got the cigarettes, <laughs> I had the money. What kind did you smoke? 
uh, camels and Lucky Strike in Chesterfield. <laughs> Back in those days, they didn't have filters, did they? No. Did your mom and dad know that you smoked? I think they did because I hit them in the basement up on a log. <laughs> and my dad was smoking too, and he, wanted, he, he quit eventually. And I smoked for six years. What caused you to stop? My wife. But she didn't, she didn't say anything. She was an example. She was Christian, and I wasn't. And I wanted to be like her. I followed her example. Okay. And what, now, what was her name? Her name was Helen. Helen? Uh-huh. And what was Helen's maiden name? Wrightstone. Whitestone? Right. It's W-R-I-G-H-T-S-T-O-N-E. Where and how did you meet uh, Helen? Uh, we, we were in the same neighborhood, and when we went, to, uh, I didn't know her in elementary school because we went to different schools. But when we got in, uh, well, I met her mostly in church, and uh, I knew her parents. I became acquainted with her mother and father. She was the only child. Her mother and father were Christian people, very nice people, and they influenced me. And, uh, but I never talked to Helen, only a low, I never had any connection until after the war, till I was discharged. All right, so when did you graduate from, from high school? Well, I was, I was 18 at the beginning of the senior year, and I was drafted. So what year was my, that? My father was 1943. Okay. And my father and the school board, they both approached the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, draft, the board. draft board, and they asked for a deferment. And uh, the school board agreed that if one, well, my grades would be uh, passing on January the 1st of 1944, I would receive a diploma. And, uh, and the draft board accepted that. In the meantime, my friends were in the Merchant Marine. I had four or five friends in Merchant Marine. They were already in. And they, they uh, contacted me and they said, what do we do, join the Merchant Marine? So I went to Baltimore and joined the Merchant Marine. Uh, is that where you signed up in Baltimore? In Baltimore, yes. That was Union. I had to go to the Union Hall and do that. And well, I went to the Merchant Marine first, then I, then I had to go from there to the Union Hall and join the Union. And then I went back to the draft board and told them I'm a member of the Merchant Marine. They said, that's fine and dandy. We accept that. And uh, then uh, I had my, my passing grades on January of 1944. Then in May of 44, uh, I received a diploma, but my father went to the uh, graduation and received it for me. Because you were already in the service. Uh, yes, I was in Europe or someplace. Well, now, somebody that's going to be viewing this uh, years down the road, I want you to explain what you mean by you joined the Merchant Marine, but you had to go to the Union Hall to explain that to us. See, the Merchant Marine was a civilian, as a civilian entity, and uh, it's controlled by the Union at that time. Now, I don't know about now, but the Union on the East Coast was Seafarers International Union. And the, in the West Coast, in California, it was the same one, they had a different name. And uh, when you would board a ship, we had to go to the Union Hall, and they had a, a, a blackboard on the wall, and they listed the ship's name, the company name, when the departure, when, where it was going to go. And then uh, we had to sign up according to seniority. And since I was the young, youngest in seniority, uh, I'd, I'd have last choice. So the seniors would, they would um, select the job they wanted, and I was on deck. And on deck is OS is ordinary seaman, AB is able body, but you start out as ordinary seaman on deck. And uh, so that's how we would do that. We would have to bid on the job. And if, if I couldn't get that particular ship or that trip, then I'd have to bid on the next one. I'd have to just, and that was in Baltimore. I lived in Harrisburg, it was 80 miles away. I'd travel to Baltimore. How would you get from Harrisburg to Baltimore? In a car, I'd drive down. Uh, maybe my father would take me. I, I can't remember all of that, but I, I know we, we went in a car. It was only 80 miles. Took about an hour, an hour and a half. 
and then I'd sign up. And then if the departure date was a couple of days later, I'd go home, then come back on that date and board the ship. How did you know what ships you wanted to go on? Well, see, it was on the blackboard. But how did you know what? Did uh, you show where you were heading? Uh, yes. They'd, they'd list the ship name and the company name and where it was, uh, where it was it, destined. It's a, where its destination was. And the, I'm going to add one more thing to it about the Union. The Union, before that ship departed, they would send a, a committee on, two or three people, at least two, and they would check the, uh, the linens, the food, the cigarettes, the medical, and any other necessity that we needed during that trip. If the trip was going to be eight weeks, to the, the my knowledge, they would add a couple weeks to that so you had surplus. So, you know, so you had plenty of, uh, plenty of supplies. And then the reason that the Union got involved, before the Union, I understand from the old timers, that the, the companies would send the ships out with not enough of linen, medical, and all these supplies. And in, in the middle of the ocean, they'd run out of all this stuff. And uh, I'll run in, one more thing I'll add to it. And on my six trips, we only had a problem. One time, I had an intercoastal trip from Baltimore to the West Coast. And coming back from uh, the Columbia River, it's up by Washington, Oregon, we were coming to the Panama Canal, heading back to Baltimore. About one or two days out, the captain notified us. He said, we're running out of food. And I don't know why, because we were in Oakland. We could uh, you know, receive them supplies. And, but he, he notified us. He said, we do have uh, instant mashed potatoes and some beans. <laughs> and he said, I'm, 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 I'm just telling you ahead of time what we're doing. He said, but I'm going to tell you one thing. When we hit Panama Canal, you're going to get a treat. We're getting the steaks and all the trimmings. He said, you're, you're going to have a feast. And everybody was happy. No one complained. Everybody accepted that. Okay, but, well, well uh, without the union, I'm not a union advocate, uh, but I'm on both sides of the fence because we need them on one way and another way they can be destructive. Right. They ruined a lot of companies. They wrecked a lot of businesses here in the United States where we had to send stuff to Mexico and China. But in that situation, they were needed. Right. <clears throat> and especially to make sure that you had enough provisions That's on right. board ship. Yeah, you're correct. Got it. <clears throat> so uh, when you signed up, uh, and you're, you're in Baltimore? Yes. But my, my six trips was all out of Baltimore. Well, how long, what kind of training did you get before you went on board ship? Well, when I, when I went in the Merchant Marine, when I was accepted in January of 1944, uh, we had to go to Ship, Sheepshead Bay, New York. I think it's in, if I remember correctly, it might be Long Island, but I'm not sure. We were there for, I think, three months for yep. naval training. And what military. did you learn to do? Well, they had to swim and do calisthenics. In March, they had classes on uh, military, it was really military training. Um, the most dangerous thing I had, I, I was afraid of water, I couldn't swim, and we had to go up on a deck, and I don't remember how f many feet it was down to the water, but we're lying up in a line, and one by one you jump in and swim to the other end of the pool. And if you didn't jump in, they'd push you. And uh, I did that, and I passed it, but I was afraid, I had a fear, I always had a fear of height. But I passed that, and then at the, about 5.30 in the morning, we were called to duty. We had a march a couple mile in the dark. And then we'd have chow around 7 or 7.30. And then um, I, myself and another mate pulled a fast one. Since it was dark, we were marching along barracks. <laughs> we saw an offset. And we decided just to stand there and let the other goose march. <laughs> so we played hooky a couple times. And, well, but uh, young kids, you do anything, you know, for fun. Uh -huh. We never got caught. <laughs> but we, we saved walk a lot of mouths. But then we'd have chow. And then we'd come back and do the swimming. And then I have in my record somewhere, I don't know where I found it, but I had gun training. 
but I can't remember much about that because on the six trips I had, four of them were armed. The one went to South America. Since that was uh, local along the coast, we didn't have guns on that or armed guard. And the one from the East Coast and West Coast, we had we had armor on that was a victory ship, but we didn't have any uh, Navy gunners because it was intercoastal. But the four trips over the Atlantic, we had uh, Navy armed guard, and they were they were well armed. We had uh, I think four fifties and three fifties guns on the on the bow and on the stern. And then up on the uh, upper decks, we had uh, machine uh, guns allotory for aircraft. Okay. And we had twelve Navy gunners and an officer. And if we were attacked, why they would take they would go to their station. Well, I show here on your list that the first uh, ship you went out on was a Henry D. Witton, W-H-I-T-O-N. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. In May of uh, 1944, and that w the employer was a Union Sulphur Company. Uh huh. Do you remember where you went on that? Yes, we went to uh, from Baltimore, the British Guiana, in South America. We picked up bauxite. And bauxite is uh, looks like sand. It's made to, uh, made to, uh, for aluminum. And during the war, there was such a demand for aluminum for airplanes and all all type of war material. They used aluminum, and uh, so we went up there and they loaded that. It was bulk. They had a big pipe. They just loaded it, and we weren't there very long. Maybe only a day. And I'll add one thing to that. When we got there, it was all jungle. And we were informed by the locals that could talk English not to go off because it was thick jungle. And they said, if you get off and get in that jungle, you may not get back, you'll get lost. And there was uh, snakes and uh, quicksand. And uh, I believed that. But the thing that I never did prove was uh, they said there's natives that they don't welcome visitors. And they said they had poison arrows and stuff. They said, and don't even walk on the deck of the ship because they might shoot at you. They said it did happen. But I, I agree with them that I'd get lost in the jungle. I had no reason to go out there. And, and you get in the quicksand and poison and uh, poisonous snakes. So there was no reason to do that and lose your life. Well, uh, how big was the ship, uh, the, that, the Union Sulphur Company? Well, that was small. That was a freighter. And they scrapped it at one time, and since there was such a demand for uh, war Still. material, th they took it, what they call out of mothballs, <laughs> and they uh, rebuilt it and put it into service. And on that trip, I had a sale in the in the kit in the gallery as a um, the help the steward, because I couldn't I couldn't get a job as ordinary seaman on deck because I wasn't old enough. I mean, the, the seniors bid on them jobs at the union hall. So I had to wash pans and serve tables and uh, scrub so floors and do all that kind of stuff on that. That trip was only six weeks, I think. So you were a galley man on galley that? Galley man on that one. Uh, tell me about your sleeping accommodations on board that ship. Well, they call it a forecastle, and we had cots. There was a, a lower cot near the deck, and then there was one above. And the seniors, they, they had the the privilege to have the lower decks a better one because you didn't have to climb. And uh, when I, since I was low in seniority, I had to take the upper deck. Well, did uh, on that first trip, did uh, any of the crew get seasick or any of the Navy guys? No, I never heard of it. Okay. And I never did either. So, and we uh, had bad storms while you're on that. We had bad storms where we had to head into them. We had to change course and go off of our course, like if we were heading due, due east, we'd have to go maybe north, so we went capsize. Right. And we'd do that for several hours till the storm was over, but we'd go slow down speed, and just would go up and down like that. And the water would come clear up over the ship. Right. And if you joined the deck, you wouldn't make it. You'd uh -huh. just swept off. So you had to stay inside. So you had to stay below deck. Or below deck, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what kind of a um, little conning tower or place where the, uh, the ship's captain was, 
What, how can you describe that? No, that was high. Uh, never in that, we weren't allowed to go there, but the officers had their own uh, quarters and they had their own mess room, or I mean where they would eat, and their own own restrooms. They had all their, all their own quarters were very private. The how captain, the captain, and there was a first and third mate, they were, they were on deck. Then there was a first and third and chief engineer that run the engine room. So though all those officers, they had their own quarters. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't see them except when I was, on, when I was a sailor, ordinary or AB, AB on deck, then I would see uh, the third mate. How was the food on board uh, that uh, Witten boat? It was good. There was no, nobody complained. It was very good. So this is this is in, in 1944, and you got about six weeks out there in, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh -huh. Did you have any uh, German U-boat threats uh, during your trip? Now, since you mentioned that, before before we arrived on our trip, like in 1942 and 43, the U-boats were down there sinking ships because they wanted they wanted to defer the shipment of bauxite. They wanted to stop the supplies because the United States was supplying uh, England and France and the Allies with material, and they thought Hitler thought if he could if he could uh, disrupt the supplies that would help him to win the war, and he sank a lot of our ships down there right where we went in at uh, British Guiana. But what happened? Our Navy, uh, I have to really give our Navy a lot of credit. They sent destroyers down there and they got them out of there. They sank them. And then Hitler decided he, that was enough. He wouldn't send any more back. So I was fortunate when we got there in 1944, uh, the Navy had them out of there. Okay. And along our coast from New York, Boston, New York, Norfolk and Philadelphia along there, they were sinking our ships, our merchant ships before Pearl Harbor. And I don't know why, uh, I have no, knowledge of why we weren't at war before, well, before let me, Pearl Harbor, because we were attacked, our ships were attacked. Let, let me take you back to high school. Do you remember uh, when the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor? Yes, I do. How did you find out about that attack? Well, what happened, we were in school at the time on December the 7th, and now the principal closed everything down. He said, everybody assemble in the assembly room, which was hundreds of students and teachers. We all crowded in there. He had a loudspeaker. And uh, he put uh, President Franklin Roosevelt, his speech where he declared war. We heard him. He, uh, he said the speech was coming on. The principal wanted us to hear that. He said, we were attacked at the Pearl Harbor. We are at war. Now, what'd you I, dad, could, I could visualize his voice since you mentioned that. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, what'd your dad think about that? Did he talk to you about it? it, it I can't remember too much at home. I can't remember much conversation about it except uh, I imagine he was like all parents. He wasn't very happy. You know, he was very disappointed. He would have been too old to join the service, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he was. And, and he was needed on the railroad because they needed the freight. Mm -hmm. They needed a person like him to keep the trains running, to get the freight moving. So when, when you went down to British Guiana and, and you got your bauxite, and where did you take it back to? Baltimore. Looking back to Baltimore. Did then you, I signed off and was paid, went home. Did you have any uh, part in offloading the bauxite? Oh, no, no, that was done by stevedores. Okay. That was, again, I guess that was Union too. So after you, after you landed in Baltimore, you got off the ship, and then where did you go? I went home to Harrisburg. I was 80 miles north. And then uh, I had like a leave of several days or something like that, a week I was allowed. And then uh, I, I came back to Baltimore. I followed the rules. I went back. Well, what did you do at home during those days? I just visited the family and friends and neighbors. Did you see Helen? No, because I didn't. I knew her, but we had no contact. <laughs> not yet. Okay. Not, not yet. All right. Not yet. Not so you not go yet. back to Baltimore, where you're supposed to be. Yeah, I went back to Baltimore, went to Union Hall, and I, I can't remember. We had to join and pay a, 
initiation fee to join and we had a card right. that we were a member, a paid up member, honorable member. I go in and show them a card and look at the board. That board's like that board, that, that white board now, when it's black. And I had all the ships down there. And I'd look at the ships and uh, uh, say, well, I want to go there. And I'd go over and sign my name. And then if a, uh, if a person, a seaman more senior, signed his name, then I was out. You got bumped. No, I got bumped. And then I'd, I'd look at the next ship and pick another one. But it always seemed to work out. I didn't have any problem. Well, your next ship was uh, the John Schof Schofield. Yes, I remember that name. S-C-H-O-F-I-E-L-D. Uh-huh. And that was uh, owned by Sudden and Christian Steamship. Yes, uh-huh. And where did you go? That was July 24th of 1944. Where did you go? I went to Leghorn, Italy. And we had a, you'll laugh at this, we had a load of beer. <laughs> you had a load of beer. For the soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> we also had uh, other food supplies and some material. But as a rule, as a general rule, they didn't inform the seamen or the crewmen what they had. But the only reason I knew that, I could see it when they were unloading it or uh -huh. something like that. But we weren't supposed to be involved. They had, uh, at this time in Leghorn, they had prisoners, German prisoners unloaded. And uh, th there was, uh, at, at that time, the German, the front was 12 mile north, but I could hear the gunfire. And then our ship was near, you see that red brick building over there? Yes. Right out that window? Well, it was, the building was about that close, and there was a little bit farther away from that, and there was German snipers in there. That'd be about what? No, I'm, 40 or 50 yards? Yeah, no, maybe, maybe make it more distance than Football that. field? Yeah, football field away. And uh, but an army MP came on with a big gun. He held it down like that, and he said, uh, "Don't go over there." He said, "You won't come back." He said, "Don't go down that gangplank." He said, "What we want you to do is get this unloaded, get out of here, and go back to Baltimore and get another load." He said, "We need supplies," and he said, "There's sniper." I could hear the gunshot. He said, "There's army and marines in there now, getting the snipers out there, going room by room." I said, "Well, why are they there?" He says, "I don't know, but they're there." And what was the name of the town? Leghorn. Leghorn. L-E-G-H-O-R-N. It's on the northwest part of, it's, it's below the Tower of Pizza. Okay. And on the way over, we dropped off mail in Rome, some mail. We just pulled up to a dock, and someone in a boat took a mail for soldiers. And then uh, we didn't stay there long, just to unload that mail. And then we went to Leghorn with all of our material, the beer and all the other material they had. And then uh, we weren't there very long. And the, the, the Army MP said our biggest danger was, he said the Germans have uh, skin drivers, skin drivers with uh, 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 magnetic bombs. And he said they stick them on the side of the ship and blow a hole in you. And I, we wouldn't probably get killed unless you was in that area. But he said that's your only danger. But he said we, he said, we can't protect you from that. They said, the best thing we could do is unload you and get you moving out of here. And they had the uh, Italian prisoners do the unloading. And the first thing I noticed, the prisoners came on board. The first thing they did, they went to the garbage cans. And they started digging garbage out and eating it. And I said to the MP, I said, sir, can I go in there in the mess hall and get them some sandwiches? Oh, no, no, he said, don't touch them. He said, don't get near them. He said, they had a big meal. We feed them really well. He said, that's your, their, their tradition and their custom. And he said, we don't, we don't mess with their custom, their tradition. He said, just leave them alone. And he said, just go do your job. In other words, he was telling me to disappear. So uh, how, how many German and Italian prisoners did you have on board? There was about six or, about six or eight that I saw there, six, uh, six anyhow. They were there to unload it. Oh, they just unloaded, unloaded them. It. They were unloaded. So they didn't, you didn't bring them back to the States? Oh, no, no. They, they, they used them as stevedores to unload. Because they were, and they'd done a good job. They were very friendly. And uh, they, they appreciated the Americans. Could any of them speak English? No, I didn't talk to them. He told me not to get, he told me to just stay away from them. Okay. So how long did it take your ship to get from Baltimore over to, uh, Italy. 
take a couple weeks because and what took so, it took long because what happened we had to use a zigzag course we couldn't encounter the U boats we we would uh, take we wouldn't go on a straight line we would zigzag we'd go we'd go one way for uh, about 15 20 minutes then we'd change course and uh, while I was an ordinary seaman and an AB seaman, my job was to steer the ship. So we had two compasses, a regular compass and a gyro, and uh, it took longer to answer your question. It might take two weeks. Well, it was a long haul, I know that. Where are you steering the ship from, above deck or below deck? All above deck, up in the wheelhouse. It was the, high, the highest point in the ship. And you're, and you're steering it? Yes, uh-huh. And what was, what was your... Uh, uh, job designation? Well, I, I started off as OS, that's Ordinary Seaman. Ordinary Seaman, okay. And then we had a, an officer, uh, since I was on the third shift, my officer was a third mate. He was the youngest officer, and he would tell me what course to take, when to change course, and what to do. We had two compasses, a regular compass and one called a gyro, and we looked out of the synchronizer to make sure we were okay. Well, uh, on the way over to Italy, were you in a convoy or were you by yourself? Well, we had both ways. Uh, sometimes we now had. This a is a tr this is a trip over to Italy. Yeah, I think in Italy we ha I think we had a convoy then. Did you have a convoy coming home? No, I don't think we did. No, no, we came alone. But where we had protection, the, the, our biggest danger with U-boats was at the Rock of Gibraltar. And that my first trip we're talking about now, when we got to the Rock of Gibraltar, I was steering a ship, I was the helmsman, and the third mate looked at me and he said, uh, if we get through here, we can breathe easy. I said, sir, what do you mean? He said, there's U-boats in this area. And about that time I looked over, here's a great big uh, U.S. destroyer beside us. I said, sir, we're, look here, we have company. We have because they were protective and the U-boats were afraid of uh, our Navy because our Navy had high technology and a high success rate of sinking them or making them run. But they, our Navy preferred to sink them. Uh -huh. And they sink a lot of them. And then after we got in there, the officer said the next problem is mines, but they, the Navy had what they call mine sweepers and they swept. And I think the trip we're talking about now, after we got into the Mediterranean, some German planes came over, but uh, we had, a, at that time, there was a convoy. And we, we had smoke bombs, or like a drum, and the, the, the Navy armed guard, they handled them. They took them, as they, uh, they, they opened them so the smoke would come out, and the destroyers beside us, they did the same thing. So they covered the whole convoy with smoke. The merchant ships in the, uh, the Navy and so the, the planes didn't have a target, but our destroyers had a radar that they could pick up the planes way off and they knew when they were coming and when they get there, they knew when to set the smoke bombs off. Okay. Now, uh, on that trip over to Italy, did any of the uh, Navy men on board have to fire any of the armament? No, no they didn't, no. We were fortunate. Okay. so. You're on your way back, and you get back uh, safe and sound back to Baltimore mm -hmm. uh, when you're on the Schofield. Uh, on the trip back, did you have any problems? So no, were you, no, were you still zigzagging on the way back? No, no, I don't think we did as much. We did a little, but not too much. All right, so you get back to Baltimore. Did you have any free time then? Yeah, I had a, a week or so free time, and then I went home for, you know, maybe a week, whatever was allowed. I don't know what the allowance was now, but whatever it was, then I'd come back to Baltimore to go to the Union Hall and repeat that sign up again. Well, how did you get paid? Uh, you're a civilian, aren't you? Yes, yeah, civilian. They paid us by the trip uh, so much a day, and then if I worked overtime, whatever that amounted to, they'd give us time and a half. And I can't remember the exact dollars, but at that time it wasn't like it is today, maybe maybe a trip like that would be 1500 or 1800 or something like that. Okay. Now, your, your duty on board ship uh, on each trip, was it the same or did they change shifts on you? No, I, I kept, since I was low in seniority, uh, 
all, all my career in the Merchant Marine, I always managed to get the midnight shift because I was low in seniority. Every trip I get on, we had, uh, I had senior men that was sailing for, like, for 20 years or more. They were, I was eight, 19, 20 years old. Some of these sailors were like 40 years old, 50 years old. They were, that was their career. And they had seniority, so they would always get the... They got the pick the, of the litter, didn't they? Pick of it, yeah. <laughs> So you uh, you had the midnight shift. You worked from midnight to what time? Four in the morning. And then when four. did you go back? And then uh, 12 noon to four in the afternoon. Uh, then if I worked overtime, like the only time I could work overtime would be after breakfast, maybe from uh, eight to 10, something like that, two hours. And what I would do would be paint. I would uh, chip rust and paint or fix ropes or anything that was broke on deck, uh, I'd work on it. And then we had to make our own uh, paint, like the primer was red. We had uh, powder, that's illegal now, because it's lead. Mm -hmm. And we'd take, uh, we'd take this out of a bucket and dip it into another bucket and put water in it and stir it and make red lead. That was like primer. Okay. And then uh, I had a putty knife for the wire brush, scrape the rust and then put that on leave that for a couple of days, then we come back and put gray paint on top of that, uh, uh, court, uh, one, or two, one or two coats. But mostly it was painting and fixing ropes and canvases. We'd have to watch that uh, everything on deck was good shape. Okay. Repaired. So did the, uh, the Navy Armed Guard on your ship, did they have separate quarters? Yes, they had separate quarters. And we didn't, um, we didn't mingle. We didn't play cards together, eat together. They had their own uh, on mess hall. They, they ate at their own place. And uh, they, did, they stayed separate from us for some reason. Okay. So you 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 come back home and you spend some time at home and then you spend some time back in uh, at uh, at the ship. And I've got down the next ship you went on was the William Harper. Do you remember that? Well, yeah, the Harper was place. owned by Waterman Steamship Corporation. That's number three. Number three. Waterman Steamship. Uh, William Harbor. Oh yeah, we went back to Italy. Uh, we went back to Leghorn with that, with more war material. We had ammunition and food, medical, and things like that. Okay. And then at that time the Germans were gone. The, the German army was gone, and we had liberty. I went ashore, I was allowed to go to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, I cannot remember how we got there, but I guess some native took us in a van, but I do not, two or three people went there, but I don't remember. All I remember, I walked around it uh -huh. and looked at it. So I could at least say I saw the leaning tower. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you think of it? I, I was impressed. Yeah, you're, because leaning over is when it don't fall. <laughs> you're, you're 18, 19 years old. Yeah. You've seen the leaning tower. I piece. saw it. Uh -huh. Yeah. How, how long was your leave there uh, in Leghorn? Just a couple of days, because they didn't waste any time on loading. They unloaded it and then uh, they sent us back. At now, that time, at let that me time, ask you about being in port. Then, uh, was there still the threat of any German uh, scuba divers putting no, bombs no, on you? No, they had them all out of there. Okay. Or Army Marines and and Navy SEALs and all them people worked together. Now we have a tremendous military force, and they had them all going cleaned out. On the way over, coming through the Cape of Gibraltar, did you have any threat of submarines that second no. time? No, I think okay. our Navy had them cleared out. Okay. So, uh, on that second trip over there to Leghorn, did you did you do the zigzag on the way no, over? No, uh, no. On the way back? No. Uh. So you got back from there uh, May the sixth of nineteen forty-five. Um, and then in June of 45, you went back on the Waterman Steamship Corporation on the George E. Pickett, P-I-C-K-E-T-T. Yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where you went? Yeah, we went to Cuba, 
and we picked up a load of uh, sugar, bulk sugar, for Amsterdam, Holland, Netherlands. And uh, Cuba, I was impressed there because they had coffee and little shot glasses that looked like used motor oil. And uh, <laughs> I couldn't drink it. I took a sip and spit it out. <laughs> and, uh, but one thing I noticed in Cuba at that time, uh, a lot of it was owned by Americans, and it was plantations, and they had, uh, one thing I remember about it, they had uh, a housing where the workers, they lived there, and the stores were there. In other words, the, uh, the owner owned the workers. So he okay. told the workers, it was a compound, but they were getting paid, but I never saw anything like it before. I can't, I can't describe uh, the terminology, but I, I saw that and it was explained to me. And the sugar, where we loaded the sugar, it was a plantation. They had all these houses, they were neat, they were comfortable. Like, I wasn't in them, but the workers didn't complain. And I couldn't talk Spanish at the time. I learned a little bit later, I'll tell you that later. But uh, I was impressed with what I saw there. But it didn't take long to load the sugar, because they, they loaded it bulk like they load grain. Uh -huh. And it went, went pretty fast. You know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like a throwback of the uh, coal mine companies, company towns, mm -hmm. where the coal mine owned the town and uh, yes, uh -huh. everybody had to shop at the, at the coal mine store. And mm -hmm. Is it kind of like that? That's what that was. That was exactly like that. The people lived there. They had a shop there. They, they, maybe they had a privilege to go someplace else, but it was so handy. And then they would buy. They didn't have to have any money because it would be deducted from their pay. Right. That's what happened in the old coal mine towns. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you picked up the sugar and you went over to Holland? Uh, we went to Holland? Amsterdam and uh, we unloaded it there. And I was impressed Amsterdam was very beautiful. And the people could talk English. And uh, I don't know if I should put this on tape. <laughs> Daughter told me not to. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I met a girl there. She wanted to marry you. She, she said, I want to marry you and have your baby. And uh, she well, kept how, talking. How long did you know her before she told you that? <laughs> a couple <of> days. <laughs> well, anyhow, <laughs> and anyhow, she said, I want to go to the United States. So I go back to the ship and I thought, well, why is that? I was a young kid and I didn't talk to anybody. I had no one to talk to. And I got thought, no, because she'll go, you know, I don't know her and she'll come to the United States and disappear. So I, I figured that out. I did tell someone later about that, and they said, you've done the right thing because she'd, uh, because uh, how would she get there? But anyhow, that's a mystery. That's part of the story. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's part of the, that's part of the Merchant Marine life. So uh, how long were you over in Amsterdam? Uh, maybe a week. Okay. I don't know what took them so long to unload it, but they did. Besides uh, meeting, besides meeting this young girl, is she laughing? <laughs> besides meeting this young girl, now my, my wife is our camera lady for today, and uh, she's kind of, she got her mask on. You can't tell whether she's frowning or smiling, but she's laughing about that one. <laughs> besides, besides uh, meeting this young girl, uh, did you pal around with some of the other crewmen from your ship? They're in, they're in Amsterdam? No. No. Mm. Um, how was Amsterdam? Had that been damaged by air raids from no, the Germans? No, I didn't see any damage. I was around Amsterdam quite a bit, and I was amazed because the Germans were through there, and uh, it was amazing. Everything was just so beautiful. On the Clean trip, and neat. On, on the trip over to Amsterdam, uh, did you... Uh, did you go through the English Channel? Oh yes, uh huh. When you went through the English Channel, uh, could you see any of the German uh, entrenchments along the coast of France? No, I couldn't see that. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did you did you stop in England at all? No, no, we didn't. <clears throat> so you're uh, you're on the picket and. 
it shows that uh, on board that trip you were there from June 15th of 45 to January 14th of 46. So you're there, you're there aboard that ship about six, seven months. Now, did you make other trips on that what ship? Happened, we left Amsterdam, we went to Poland. Okay. We went to Poland and picked up a load, a bulk load of, con of cement. I think it was in bags. And uh, we were there maybe a week or so to load that. And I, I think when inland and a on Poland, just off the ship, just along the coast, right near the ship, as all walked around there. And a couple bar rooms, restaurants and stuff we went into. And uh, I did see our captain in there in one bar. He had six ladies. He was buying drinks Look at her. for six ladies. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was funny. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you have any young ladies there in Poland that no, wanted no. to come to the United States? No, I didn't meet any there, no. I, I was with other seamen, just a group of seamen went there. Uh -huh. But I was amazed at the captain sitting there. And I'll, I'll tell you more about the captain. We never met the captain, but I, I met him there and I met him back when we paid off. But uh, we loaded the cement. I have a story to tell you. After we left there, we were taken out to Venezuela. That's what took so long. Wow. So we came from Baltimore to Cuba for sugar, to Amsterdam, to Poland, cement, then back to Venezuela. And then uh, about one day out of uh, Poland, I was on deck. And I was walking, I heard the noise, like bang, like that. And I, I thought, well, that's not overboard. There's nothing over slapping. It's, it's, it's on board on the ship. So I pinpointed it down to the number two cargo hole, and there's uh, doors, a great big steel door you can open. So I opened the door, and I hollered down. I, I said, anybody there? No answer. But I heard again, bang, bang, bang. And I didn't want to go any further myself. It was too dangerous. So I, I, I saw an officer, and I said to her, I said, sir, there's something at number two cargo hole. There's something wrong. So he got another seaman with a couple flashlights, and the two of them went down. There was a, a ladder. And they found a stowaway, a young boy, about a teenager, <clears throat> 18, 19 years old. <clears throat> and he had a big loaf of bread like that and a jug of water. Huh. And uh, he, was, he was one of the steve doors to load the ship. And when they got it loaded and put the hatch down, he stayed down there. They covered him up and put the canvas and everything on. He wanted to come to the United States. <laughs> and uh, so anyhow, we brought him up. He was Polish, he couldn't talk English, but our steward was Polish and he could communicate with him. And I thought we'd get him to work, but he wouldn't do any work. Uh, and they, they left the captain and officers and left him go. He, he just had a free ride across the ocean. And we got to Venezuela and unloaded the cement. The captain said he has to get off because it was illegal to come to the United States. So they made him get off in Venezuela. That poor kid talked Polish and he was in Spanish country. String. <laughs> so I have no idea what happened to him. But I often thought about it. I'm the one that found him. So why, why, why was Venezuela wanting uh, cement? I don't know what they were doing then. They were probably building dams or highways or something. They didn't have any. So after you offloaded your cement, where did you go? Well, then we went back to, uh, now, on my six trips, three went back to Baltimore, but one went to Dallas and Texas, one Norfolk, and one New York. But I think that one went back to Baltimore. Do I have it on there where it went to? No. But you're, you're an AB at that time. What's an AB? Uh, that's able body seaman. That's as, that's as high as, that's the high, highest ranking in, on deck. Because then the next ranking is officer. And you never and made we, officer? I didn't want to. Why? And kind of the prostitutes and, and liquor. Okay. I didn't want to live like that. Okay. I just wanted to get married and settle down and be decent life. Well, now, uh, when you got back from uh, Venezuela, of course, uh, the war with Germany was over, mm -hmm. as well as the war with Japan, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you remember where you were when uh, when uh, the U.S. dropped the uh, atom bomb on uh, on Japan, I think it was somewhere in the Pacific. 
we were heading for an invasion. And uh, I think we'll, can I see this? Sure. Okay, now I had a trip in between there on this here Lynn Victory. That was a short trip from Baltimore to Oakland, California, and the Columbia River, and, and back to, I'm gonna to have to complete this and put where we came back to, probably back to Baltimore. And th that was a short trip along the uh, intercoastal. But then the last trip, to answer your question on, on the bombs, uh, I was on, on, on the, my last trip, uh, 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 that was a long one, it was seven months. Uh, I went to, uh, from Baltimore, to Bahia Blanca, Argentina. We were supposed to get a load of wheat and go to Marseille, France. And I didn't know why I was going to Marseille, but I'll tell you about that later. We get to Bahia Blanca for a load of wheat to go to Marseille, France, and they didn't have it. We had to wait six weeks. And while, while I was walking on the dock at Longest Ship one day, two young boys came up, Argentina boys, teenagers, and they talked fluent English. And they said, can we talk to you? I said, yes. And then I took them up on the ship, a complete tour of the ship and everything. I spent an hour or <laughs> more with them. And uh, then they said, well, you were so kind now, would you come to our home? I said, yeah, I appreciate that. So the whole six weeks I was there, I spent s several days a week on my off time, because at that time I didn't have to do the 12 to 4, it was just like 8 to 5. Mm -hmm. So then in the evening, I go over, there was two, two teenage boys and two teenage girls. And uh, so we had a lot in common, and uh, I helped them with English by talking to them. They taught me Spanish. And then I could go shopping on my own, and everything was safe then. And uh, I was impressed with Bahia Blanca, it was beautiful. Argentina was just a beautiful, what I saw of it, it was country, a lot of wheat, a lot of farmland, cattle, and everything was very reasonable. And uh, I walked around by myself, uh, and the drugstores looked like Walgreens or CVS, they had all American products in there. And I, I went in a store to buy a shirt like this, and I could say uh, Quanta Costa, that means how much it costs. And he'd, say, he'd tell me in Spanish, and I knew what it was. And I, I learned to get along that way. And uh, I could live there, it was so beautiful. But what I liked about the Spanish was they protect the girls. They're very protective. You can't go with them unless you have an escort. So we went to the movie, I went to the movie with a, one of the girls, but the brother goes along. Mm -hmm. There's three of us. And I don't remember, if I, I don't think I held her hand or anything, I don't think I was legal. You don't touch them, you're just with them. Do you remember her name? No, I don't. And I made a mistake there because I should have got their name and address and, and then I could communicate with them now because they were teenagers and I imagine some of them younger people would be still surviving. Okay. But I, I made that mistake. <coughs> it was there six weeks. Then we took off with that wheat and took it to Marseille and unloaded it. Then we picked up lo loading barges and I had no clue what they were for. But uh, I'm going to answer your question now about the bombs. We loaded these barges for the Army and Marines to make a, an invasion into Japan. Mm -hmm. We went down to the Panama Canal, up, up across the Pacific. And uh, at, at that time frame in there is when they dropped the bombs. And then uh, when we got up to make the invasion, we assembled all these ships, Merchant Marine and Navy. And I talked to an Air Force man later on Okinawa and uh, with the Air, our Air Force was gonna bomb the runways and the fuel dumps. And uh, the pilot told me, he said, um, we figured if we'd accomplish that, then they could take off, or if they did take off, they couldn't come back. And then they were gonna do that while we were uh, landing on the beach. But the merchant sailor like myself would do that, it would be the Army and Marines, but we had to get the, the landing barges off the ship into the water. And I had no clue how it was going to happen. Because what happened, a typhoon came up. As we were ready to do that, we had to go 200 miles away so we wouldn't get sunk. And the Air Force, they took their planes away so they wouldn't get destroyed. And then after 10 days, we got a radio, uh, 
we got a radio message after about four or five days to come back. So we were going all together about 10 out and back. Mm -hmm. We came back and assembled. The Air Force came back and they got ready. And we were hundreds of ships, supply ships and Navy. And I didn't see the Army and Marines, but they were someplace. I don't know where at. And I had no clue what we were doing. I was a young kid. Until after it was over, I realized what we were up to. But then while we were, the second time we was ready to invade, uh, unload this stuff, we got a radio message that the war is over. The Emperor signed a peace treaty. And uh, they said, come to Yokohama. So we went to Yokohama and unloaded some of it, then went to Tokyo and unloaded the rest of it. And I had leave there of a couple of days. And I spent a couple of days in Tokyo and I visited a Japanese family uh, walking up the street, myself and another seaman. We were hunting a restaurant to get something to eat. And we went like this to motion to something to eat. And this man said, so he went, and we followed him into his house. And it was beautiful. And he went like that to a chair, sit down. So we sit down, white tablecloth and flour on there and a candle, beautiful. And he went and made tea. And, the th and the th th it was just a man and uh, he dressed with a robe, mm -hmm. Chinese, Japanese, and then we sat there and had tea with him. And I went to pay him later on, I offered him some Japanese money. No, 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 I insulted him. Uh -huh. So I put that away and I bowed, they bowed, they don't shake hands, they bow like that. But did you see any damage uh, on the island of Japan at all? No, no I didn't. Every place, and we took a train ride then after we had our tea with this gentleman, and then, uh, we, we were very adventurous, myself and another seaman, and uh, we had Japanese money. We went up to a train station and bought a ticket. We had no clue where it was going. We just bought it. <laughs> we gave him some money and he gave us a ticket. So we got on board. It was, an, uh, it was a local, like it would go 10 miles stop, then 10 miles stop. So we, I said, we better watch yourself, we'll get lost. So we counted five stops and got off at the fifth. And then we walked around and a bunch of little kids followed us. And I felt bad we didn't have any candy for them. And, uh, but they, they were very friendly, the kids. They just followed us because we were, looked strange. And then uh, after about an hour or so, we went back to the station. There were two tracks, one that way and one that way. So we got the one going back, and the train came, we got on, we counted five and got off. <laughs> <laughs> that was some adventure. But I enjoyed Tokyo, and I didn't see any damage, and everyone was so courteous. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's one trip I missed there across the Atlantic. Oh, uh, one one was the, an Ismanian steamship, uh, the, L, the Lynn. Victory, L Y N N yeah, Victory. That was intercoastal. That was a short trip. Yeah, it was a short trip from Baltimore to Oakland and Cal uh, the Columbia River. But and the, the last thing you were talking about was American Pacific SS that's, Company. That's, that's the one I went to Japan. Uh, the Mylan R Stefanik, uh -huh. S T E F A N I K. Yeah, that, that was Japan. <coughs> but there's one in there I missed the North Africa and Pakistan, and India. And uh, what that was. We went out of Baltimore and dropped off something in Oran, Africa. Then went through the Suez Canal down to Pakistan, or Karachi. Karachi. That was India, but now it's Pakistan. Pakistan. Mm -hmm. They changed. And uh, there I almost died. Uh, there's 36 crew members, counting the officers and the captain and the Navy. And I was the only one that got dysentery. And um, I think there was something, they brought, they brought fresh fruit on, and vegetables, something like that. And something struck me in the stomach and I got terribly sick. And um, I was gonna walk with some friends on, just take a walk. And uh, I went down the gangplank and I got real severe pain. And I went back, stayed in the room a while and then went down again, got pain. And I, could, I realized I'm pretty serious, I can't make it. Then I went back and laid down my bunk and I asked somebody, a sailor, I said, try to get me some help. I said, I can't make it. I'm very, very bad. And uh, then I passed out like into a coma. And I didn't wake up till midnight. 
And when I woke up, I was in an American dispensary with a white American doctor, army doctor, and he knew what I had. And he, uh, he gave me the medicine and told me I don't work for a week. And he said, you just got here in time. He said, if you don't left much longer, you'd have died. And uh, so anyhow, I was very sick, very white. I lost a lot of weight and pale. And uh, it was like he said, I didn't work for a whole week. We went from there to Salon, which is Sri Lanka now. And then I got down there, I started to recuperate. And he said, um, when I'm recuperating, have chicken soup, this mm -hmm. soup and a couple of crackers. He said, go real easy, but it'll take you a week to get back on a full diet. And uh, I was the only one out of the whole crew that that happened to. But I survived it. And then we got down there uh, and the unloaded us. Uh, pulled up and they all loaded. We had some free time and myself and another guy went to Candy, that's in the middle of Allen, and went into a Buddha temple. And I saw a, a great big Buddha, he was tall as this room, gold. Mm -hmm. And a lady came in with flowers, and put them down his feet and got down and prayed to Buddha. And then we had a tour guide talk going to English and he took us a tour around, explained everything, all the planets and the stars, moon, sun, all that, they worship all that. And then uh, I was about an hour tour, and I, I went to offer him a donation, and he said, no, don't, don't do that. And you have to take your shoes off outside, or we'll go on stocking feet. And then uh, it was a train ride, it only went about five mile an hour, up and down a great big mountain. <laughs> and uh, it took a long time to come over, and a long time to go back. There was one track, and at the top of the mountain, there was a side track, you pull off and wait for the train to go the other way. And we finally got back, and then uh, our ship was ready to leave. And then, and then we uh, got on a ship and came back to the United States. Mm. Well, uh, this uh, document here shows that you uh, you were discharged at the end of the conflict. Uh, the date of service terminated May 6, 1945. Yeah, that's Europe. And I don't know why they did that. I should have one with discharge to Japan. I wonder how I could get that. Well, you you have on your bio that you filled out for me that you were uh, you were in service until April 1947. Yeah, I was. Uh huh. So what did you do all that time? Uh, well, see, give me them ships again. The name of them ships. See what they're doing. And I, I often question that why that is, because the end of the conflict. <coughs> Japan, Japan surrendered in '45, as well as uh, Germany, but a little bit after Germany. Mm -hmm. Oh, here I'm over here. Yeah, right here. The what, what, that their discharge. When's that now? '45. Uh, yes. Yeah. May sixth of '45. Yeah, see here, I was so on that, that ship there. That, that would have been May 6th of 45, you're on the William Harper. Yeah, Harper, yeah. Then these other, other ships, where I went, uh, this one here, made the end. Uh, see, I had to stay in though, I had... Uh, number of points. Number of points, yeah. So after the European War, I stayed in after the war Japan was over. Yeah, I was into that. Was overseas Japan. Was and then you were still in until 1947. Yeah. What did you do? We we'll see. Now this last trip, I got off at January of 22nd, but they didn't make my discharge until uh, the one from the Coast Guard. They made it April. April 47. Yeah, April 47. Okay. And I don't know why the difference there because I was home. Now, from January the 22nd of 47, I was home. All right. But they still made it, uh, there was a gap in there from January, February, March, April, three months. Three okay. months. All right. Three months gap. Um, but they're going by the European war and not the Japanese war. Uh, when did you get together with Helen? On my last trip when I came back from Japan, and what happened there with Helen, on my trip to Japan, after we loaded the uh, landing barges in Marseille, France, 
We was halfway across the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, one of the officers was uh, was my mentor. He was teaching me navigation and stuff. He said, uh, "I want to send you to when we we finish this trip. I'd like you to go to New London, Connecticut, to officer school." And uh, he was very impressed that I would do that, and I thought, no. And halfway across the ocean, I thought, I have to settle down. I don't want to live like that. And then I got thinking of Helen. And I thought, halfway across the middle of the ocean, I sort of fell in love with her. <laughs> I thought, boy, I thought. Did you oh, write to her oh, all this time? No, no, we had no connection, no connection whatsoever. But uh, of all the friends I had in the life I had, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And uh, I, I thought, I want to get with someone that's. I don't know the word to use. Someone is decent, someone is Christian, someone is different. And I settled down, and uh, I thought, I hope she's not married, I hope she's not engaged, I hope she don't have a boyfriend. All this stuff was in my mind. So I went on to Japan, we did what we had to do and came back, the discharge went home. I went to church, and I met her in church. She was right there. And I said, I'd like to talk to you. So then that's how we got together. So she still didn't have a boyfriend, and she had one, but they weren't too, we weren't serious. I, I lucked out there. Okay. <laughs> all right. And then we went together. After we went the first time, that's all it took. Just that one. Of all places we went, it was on a Sunday. And I had a 1946 Oldsmobile car. It was a beautiful car. I got it from a doctor. A doctor owned it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to Gettysburg to the battlefield. And we walked up the uh, the round top. There was a big round top and a little round top. We walked up one of them, and uh, then the rest went on from there. Did you pop the question to her at Gettysburg? Oh no, no, no. We went together for about a year, about a year, and then uh, then we started looking at the store rings and. Uh, I said, uh, we, we just looked in the window and pointed them out, and she said, I like that, or I like that. And then later on, I went back by myself and bought it. Then I gave her the engagement ring. And then her father questioned me. We were friends. I was real, her father was just like a father to me. He, she had r super good parents. And uh, when, when we, I gave her the engagement ring, he said, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and he said, uh, what do you plan to do? I said, well, I plan to be a truck, truck mechanic. Because I went, after I after, uh, finished at the Merchant Marine, I went to Evanston, Illinois, to a commercial trade institute on gasoline and diesel engines. Mm -hmm. And I graduated there with a certification. Then I came back and uh, I was fortunate to get in with the Mack Truck Corporation. Mack Truck? Mack Truck, yeah. And where were they located? In Harrisburg? It was the Harrisburg, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg, it was a factory branch. Factory branch. Now I was able to work with some senior mechanics there for about two years. And uh, the reason I left there, they got slow at work. They got slow, and you had to go on the seniority list. And I was off for a while, and I was sort of jumpy. I didn't want to be. And I found out there was a common carrier in Lancaster, which was 50 miles away. They were working 70 hours a week, making big money. So I went down there, and they hired me right away. Well. Tell, tell me about your uh, your future father-in-law. He's asking you what you plan to do, and you tell him diesel mechanic. What's his reaction? He he, he appreciated that. He was a he was a a printer. Okay. He was a printer, but he he accepted that. He said, well, "I just want to know what you're going to do." And then uh, we we became his mother and father. We were very close. And when did you and Helen get married? April tenth of nineteen forty-eight. And did, did you guys have uh, children? Yeah, I had a daughter is here now. Her name is Lois. She's a retired school teacher from Hilliard. And what's, we, her, what's her married name? Lois Neff. Neff, N-E-F-F. -E -F -F. -F -F. Uh -huh. And she, uh, she's a super nice person. Her and I have a real close relationship. And she, since, since my wife passed, since Helen passed away, Lois, uh, she tells me what to do. <laughs> well, that's what my wife tells. Me. That's what my wife does. She tells me what to, to do. But she now, Lois, advice. you say Lois, 
lives in Hilliard, which is uh, right no, west she, of Columbus. No, she lives in Galloway. Oh, Delaware? Is, uh, Galloway. Delaway. Gal Galloway. It's G A L L O W A Y. That, that's south of yours, near near West Broad Street. That's only about 12 miles away. But her school was Hilliard. Okay. Uh, did Lois have any children? Yes, yeah, she has a son and a daughter. The daughter's a school teacher. She's a music major. And uh, 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 what's Lori, her name? Her name is Lori, L O R I, Lori. She's married and has two children. They're uh, eight and ten years old, a boy and a girl. Her husband's a supervisor at Kroger's, Kroger Company. And she's got a boy? Yeah, a boy. The boy's ten years old. What's his name? Uh, Jonathan. And he's active in sports. He's a very, both, both children are very intelligent, very active in sports. Like their and grandfather? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And then uh, uh, Lois's son, his name is Jeffrey. He's a custom builder like his father. And he's in the lighting business for uh, weddings and conventions. And he owns a lighting company. With these lights, lights that flash around. Okay. He goes to weddings. Some of the weddings he had, he had a wedding ring was a hundred thousand dollars. Oh. Uh, I mean, that's what the uh, the parents had to pay for the yeah. wedding. With a tent, orchestra, flowers, catering. A oh. lot of stuff connected, and plus him, he was paid several thousand just to put the lights up. Well, make all them flashing lights. Well, I hope the marriage will last long enough to make it worthwhile. You know, some of them don't. <laughs> that's amazing. Some of them only go five years. Yeah. And you get a you get a wedding that takes place in a barn. They're forever. Now you also had a son, Ron. Yeah, he was a mechanical engineer. And he passed away in the year two oh seven with colon cancer. Oh, I'm he, sorry. He, he lived in uh, Indiana. Uh, Angola, Indiana. He, had, he has a son. His son now is uh, he's employed by he's an associate of uh, Pizza Pizza Hut, he, and he's in his mid forties. And, uh, and Ronald I, was uh, how old was he when he passed? He was fifty eight. And Lo Lois is still with us. How old is yeah, Lois? She's seventy one. Okay. And, and I, you, you, uh, when did Helen pass away? Uh, June the sixth of last year. She was ninety two. And what happened to Helen, uh, we were going to the dentist and there was a little bump in the concrete. And we didn't see it, it wasn't noticeable. But her toe caught that as she went forward on the concrete. And there was no marks on her body whatsoever, none whatsoever. But she became, that, that wound that hurt and injured her spinal cord and she became paralyzed right there in the spot. Oh really? I tried to lift her and she said, don't lift me. She said, I can't move. And then there was a, a city worker there with a cell phone. He called the ambulance. They took her to Grant, and she was there ten days, and she was doing very well. Grant, the service at Grant Hospital was just super, just That's superb in Columbus. in Columbus. Yeah, the nurses and the doctors and everything. You couldn't find any better. And they they watched her, and she her her room was across the hall from the nursing station. They had the lights on. And they kept the door partly open where they could watch her. And they, they had an eye on her 24 hours, and she had really good therapy there. And uh, her her actually came, and her legs and her arms came back, all but she couldn't move her fingers. And they taught me how to do that, so I, I sat there all day long and gave her therapy on her fingers to get them working. And uh, she was very happy, and and uh, one, of the, one of the therapists came in, a man, and he knelt down on his knees at the bed and he, he touched her. He said, Helen, I'm the therapist and I'm going to give you therapy. And he said, we're going to walk. So she stood up and he had her walking and she said, I'm going to walk out of here. I mean, she was very, we were all positive. And then after her time was expired there after 10 days, she came back to Friendship Village here. It was in the Wealth Center and they had an old building in it. It was sort of dingy and uh, dark and we didn't see anybody. It was about eight o'clock at night. We walked in that environment. She started to cry. She said, take me out of here. Please take me back to Grant. But we couldn't do that because the ambulance left and the insurance and everything, we couldn't do it. So I finally got a nurse and the nurse said, uh, I didn't want to leave her alone at night because down there she had 24 hour observation. 
And I said to the nurse, I said, we can't do this. I can't leave her alone at night. So she, he said, she said, Julian, don't worry. Uh, uh, we'll have an eye on her all the time. But I felt uncomfortable. So the next day I said, how can I get someone full time? They gave me the name of Comfort Keepers. So I hired Comfort Keepers and they were here. They came, I stayed from uh, seven in the morning to six. And the Comfort Keeper came at six in the evening and stayed seven in the morning all night. Then I said to the Comfort Keeper, if there's anything at all unusual, call me and I'll be down here. And then um, we had different Comfort Keepers and they were really good, very caring. And then uh, I started to get exhausted and then I hired the Comfort Keepers for more hours. I kept adding four hours, then later on, and then later on I had them 24 hours. Then I could go as a visitor and stay with her. But that the, what, what ruined her, what caused her death was I think the pain medicine. That was so strong pain medicine and uh, she lost her appetite. And she just gradually, you know, mm -hmm. went. So she was here, that happened on April. April, our, our anniversary was the 10th and that happened on the 13th. Then she passed away June the 6th, so it was April, May, a little over, two, around neighborhood of two months. Well, and that was a big blow to me. I'm sure, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, you were married, you were married what, 70? 73 years. 73 years. And before years. that we had a, we had a little outing at the Dr. Dutchman in Plain City with four people and on our anniversary. Now I'm making a report, it's gonna be a little lengthy, on the military and on uh, my private, our private life and uh, my spiritual life, what happened, all the different things that happened. And I have a lady at the VFW helping with it. Well, let's, let's that'll, talk. Be, that'll be separate from this, and I'll make sure you get a copy of it, you and Susan. Well, let's talk about your, your work history. You, you became a truck mechanic uh, for Mack Truck, mm -hmm. and you were only there a couple of years. Where did you go from there? I went to a, a short motor express in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and uh, at that point in time, we were allowed to work about 70 hours a week. I was making pretty good money, but it was a 50-mile haul. So after about a week or so, we, we uh, sold our home. We didn't have it very long, but we sold it right away and moved down there into an apartment. And then uh, we were in an apartment a little while. Then we moved out to New Holland to a, a rental house. It was a full house, which was better for the, our son. New uh, Holland what? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. That's in Lancaster County near Lancaster. Now, is that when you were working for Gulf Oil? No. No, that was us with the Short Motor Express, a common carrier, as a truck mechanic. Okay. Now, at that time, uh, I'll elaborate there a little bit. I had the idea to go into trucking business, to buy a tractor and, and uh, have a uh, over the highway business. And Helen went along with it. And uh, she, she bought the tractor, it was her money, and uh, a brand new Mac diesel tractor. And I tried, to, I tried to do it with drivers and stay in the shop. But my first driver went to Florida and took a week vacation. Just it. <laughs> and I could, now I almost lost it because the payment was coming due. So when he came back, I said, I can't do it anymore. He said, oh, I quit anyhow. So then I drove it to Florida myself from Pennsylvania to Miami. And um, uh, one of the truck stops, I met a guy that was a truck driver. I don't know his history, but anyhow, he rode with me and I found out he could drive and he seemed to be honest. I hired him. And then uh, he went, we had a load out of Heinz's ketchup in Pittsburgh, and they, they put a double load on it. It was supposed to be 29,000. They put on 58,000. And he got into North Carolina and got caught. And the bill was $1,600. And they, they put him in jail, that was $200. So my father-in-law and my mother, they loaned me the money to get all the truck back and everything, to get back in business. So then I drove it myself for four years. And that'll be in my report. Uh, it's too lengthy now, but you'll read about it later. Well, what was the name of your company? Did you have it? No, I didn't have it. I, what I did, I, I subleased to like uh, 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 Chicago Express and then the Roadway, uh, Yellow Freight, and uh, all them companies now, they're not here anymore, Spectre and Motor Freight. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I rode from uh, New York to St. Louis 
and then Chicago and Boston and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It was long hauls and I was away from the family a lot. And then after four, four years, I found a, a gentleman that had the money to buy it out and it paid off all my bills. I got a good credit rating, it broke even. But after four years, we didn't make any money, we just broke even. Well, what, what kind of truck did you have? It was a brand new Mack diesel tractor. It was called an LF. Did, did it was you a single a, axle. Did you have a sleeper cab? No, no, no sleeper. That was another illegal thing. I slept in the cab. You weren't supposed to do that, but <laughs> everything was illegal. <laughs> well, when did you work for Gulf Oil? Well, then after I sold the truck, I got in with Gulf. I was there 18 years. What did you do for them? Uh, I started out as a mechanic. And uh, they hired me because they, they had a foreman going to retire, and they figured I had the uh, qualifications to be a foreman. So I worked there two years as a mechanic, and the foreman retired, and I became a foreman. And I had that job for a couple of years. And then they had an opening for a truck inspector, and a truck inspector, you're like a, a, a manager. You get a company car, an expense account, and uh, they put me in the field in Pennsylvania and New York State to go around uh, all the uh, facilities and the airports. We had uh, facilities and airports to fill the jets and the uh, planes with jet fuel and that type of thing. Aviation gas Aviation, and jet fuel. Yeah, yeah I, had a, was, I had to work on that. Where were you working out of? Where was your uh, home? Uh, Harris, near Harrisburg. Okay. And then I was there a year and a half. They called out a training period. Then they sent me to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and I, I, I had the whole state of Columbus, uh, Ohio, in Indiana and part of Illinois, a little bit, once in a while, Michigan, Detroit. But uh, I had, well, the big ones was Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Lima, Marietta, Indianapolis, and Huntington. And there was an airport in India, in Illinois, and then once in a while to Detroit. And then uh, after my, the, the, my son and daughter retired, went to college, then the Helen went with me because I, had, I was at liberty to, I was my own boss, and uh, I was at liberty to do that. Mm -hmm. So she went with me and stay in a motel. Like we'd go to Indianapolis for a week and she'd just stay there. And, and then I'd come back at five o'clock and we'd go to dinner and have the evening together. And then the Friday, and then we'd come back home to Columbus. So then you did that for about 18 years. Yeah, 18. And then the, my last year, they made me a terminal manager near Pittsburgh. I was in charge of uh, uh, product distribution in Western Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Well, did you move to Pittsburgh? Yes, uh -huh. I had to move to Pittsburgh. I was there one year. And then the Gulf Oil went sort of under. Uh, they sold out to Chevron, but I left them right before they sold out. So the timing was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania with uh, Penn Dairies. It was ice cream and dairy products. What did you do for them? Uh, I was the uh, manager, maintenance su supervisor of the tractor trailers. And you were there four and, years? Yeah, four. And then uh, what's private enterprise and postal service? Now, now that's a tricky one. Okay. <laughs> You'll laugh, that's the New York Mafia. <laughs> did you want that on tape? So what did you do? Uh, as, uh, I worked for the U.S. Postal Service. Oh, well, they had contracts with the Postal Service and the uh, Mack truck and different uh, uh, corporate corporations. With the, they, had, they had a leasing company. They owned a leasing company. And they owned a truck stop. And I was in charge of the maintenance of all these tractor trailers. Uh, and um, well, now who's yeah. that owned? That the post office? No. See the. Uh, Am I allowed to do this on tape? Wow, that's up to you, if it's legal. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I was told by the Navy not to do it. Oh. But anyhow, it called a private enterprise, and, uh, but it was out of New York. Okay. And, uh, but they owned, they owned all the tractor trailers, and they leased to the government, and they leased to different companies, and they owned a common carrier, and they owned a, they owned a, a truck stop on Interstate 80. And what'd you do for them? Uh, they had maintenance there, they had a garage and they had mechanics, and I was just like a, a manager. Kind of a so I had a company car, I'd travel around to different places. I'd travel uh, along the East Coast in Florida, Jacksonville, sometimes I'd fly, they had a plane that would fly, and I'd spend a couple of days, wherever it was required. Uh -huh. Usually other managers would go, 
like on a long haul. Yeah. I was there one year, and the uh, the operation was tremendous. I mean, it was just superb. Why did you leave there after a year? Well, uh, that was in uh, northern Pennsylvania, and uh, m our, my wife's home was in, uh, her parents lived in Enola, Pennsylvania. That's 90 miles away. And my wife looked at the paper and she saw Rite Aid Corporation had an opening for a manager, maintenance manager, and she told me about it. And that brought us back to her home. So and was that in Enola or was that in uh, Harrisburg? It was, in Har it was near Harrisburg, okay. Charmistown, near Harrisburg. Okay. So I talked to the, the boss there with this enterprise and he said, uh, he agreed, he said, do what you have to do. And he said, I, I, I'm with you. He said, I'd do it. If I was you, he said, in your shoes, I'd do it. And he patted me on the back and wished me well. And I went down there, that was a, a Jewish company. and. Uh, it was the best company I worked for. I right thought, in? Yeah, right in. I was there nine years. That was, the, of all my 40 years of trucking, that was the top of the line. And when I went there, their sales was uh, 300 million. I left, when I retired, nine years later, it was 2.3 million. I mean, 2.3 billion. And I went from uh, 13 employees in, the, in my maintenance shop to 39. Mm -hmm. And I had all specialists. I was a manager. and I. I had a lady run the office, she'd done an excellent job. I had two parts managers. I had a four, they were open, we only closed on Sunday. So I had a foreman on every shift. And then, and at last I had to put this stuff on a computer because we couldn't control it otherwise. And I trained a man, I hired a man from the White Motor Corporation, a young guy, and sent him to Philadelphia to school to learn computer and then uh, he, he got it set up and under control of the maintenance of all. We had two companies. We had a pharmaceutical company, and also there was another company, uh, Lewis Lerman Wholesale Grocery. So I had two truck fleets, a pharmaceutical fleet and uh, a grocery fleet. And, and uh, they were close together, only one block apart. We used the same facilities. Uh -huh. And uh, I trained a guy to take my job, and, and uh, I started with him right away. And he learned to be a, a manager, and he could do everything I was doing. And then my boss took and he separated the fleets. He put him in the grocery fleet. Then, uh, then I didn't have to worry about that. I only had the pharmaceutical fleet. Then I st trained another, another person. And then uh, all the people I had, I visualized it like the Ohio State football team. You had to coach them and have winner players. That was my theory. And it worked out really well. With uh, each person had a job, and they'd done it really well. Was oh, that is that where you retired from? I retired from Rite Aid. Uh huh. So I, I, was that the best paying job you ever had? It wasn't. It wasn't the money. It was the people. What was the best paying job you had? And they paid me the same as that came from uh, when. I, well, when I was with Gulf Oil, I didn't have too much of a change between the enterprise. That was the same. They kept the money the same. Uh, well, but, but, but right Aid, yes. To answer your question, that was the best paying job because they were very liberal. Every year, they gave you an increase automatically if you were doing a job. And at the last time, my last one, I went into my boss and I said, I, want, I don't want to do this. I said, I don't want the money. I'd rather have my job because sometimes you get priced out of a job. Right. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want to do that. He said, don't worry about it. He said, he said this, is, this is our policy. And he said, we have to do it. And, uh, but to answer your question, Rite Aid was the best paid job, the best people to work for. My, my boss was a German Jew, and he was super. He said, Sur surround yourself with good people. I've never forgot that. That was the best advice I ever had. And, and he, he treated me really well. His door was always open. And uh, did you talk to him very much? On oh, the, on yeah, the, yeah, just like we're talking. So was his family from Germany? Yeah, he left, he escaped Hitler when he was 17. But he uh, was born and raised in Germany. And uh, see, Ger uh, Hitler was crucifying the Jews. Right. And he realized that to get out. And he had the intelligence to get out. And he escaped and got into England. And he joined, he joined the British Army, so he fought against Germany. He was an ally then. And then after the war, he went to Israel. 
He was, he was in the Israeli army for a while, and he told me stories about being out in the sand dune, working, working out in the desert, and he said, you'd take a burning on a sand dune, and later on it wasn't there, because we <laughs> would blow it. <laughs> but uh, well, I traveled with him on the airplane, and uh, we went to, we had different places, New York and South Carolina and West Virginia, and uh, we traveled together. He was, and the, the chairman of the board was uh, Alex Grass, he was a, a Jewish person, and, and uh, Lerman, they were Jewish people, but they were all, they gave me the red carpet. They so what, were just what was beautiful. this fellow's name? This German Jew. What was his? What was his name? You remember? Probably on the tip of your tongue. Yeah, I'll think about it in a minute. I remember Alex Grass. He was chairman, and Martin was his son. Boldas. Um, his name was last name was Boldas. Martin, Bo Martin Boldass, Boldass, and his uh, secretary was Jewish, but they had all kind of people. They had uh, some of the managers were Catholic, some Protestant. It was all a mixture. Right. But it was a fine group of people. Well, I was going to ask you. Uh, I know you graduated from high school. Did you ever have any further formal education other than high school? Yeah, I had music. My mother. Uh, really started me off with piano music when I was pretty young. I had s six years with a private teacher. Then uh, when I was um, 17, she sent me to a conservatory of music in Harrisburg, and uh, that gave me a big boost. And uh, I was away from it for a good many years, but now I'm back on it now, and I, I plan after I get some of the things I'm doing now, I'm going back into music full, I want to get back into full time. Did you ever go to college, any part time or yes, community yes, I, colleges yeah, or anything? Yeah, yeah, I have, I have about two years of credits, but I did that while I was traveling with Gulf Oil. I, uh, I have credits in management, industrial management, economics, liberal arts, finance, and music. From what school? Uh, well. I went to Harrisburg Community College, and right there we had uh, professors from Penn State and Temple, and I had one from Lidlbytown College. I had speech speech classes too, and Toastmasters, and uh, I also had uh, Dale Carnegie. I took a lot of classes that wasn't none credit, but I have about two years. I, I could have an associate degree, but I never applied for it. Uh -huh. And I did that while I was traveling with Gulf Oil. In the evenings in the hotel, I'd just study. Okay. Classes. Well, uh, f from your military service, I see you've got an Atlantic War Zone bar. Yeah, there's Atlantic and Pacific. And you got a Pacific War Zone bar, a Mediterranean Middle East War Zone bar. Uh huh. Okay. Um, did you ever have any um, injuries on board ship? Uh, did you get any Purple Hearts or no, anything no, like that? No, no injuries. Huh? Um, Uh, I'm going to have Mary take, get this on. Uh, you got this uh, from from President Truman. Uh -huh. Congratulating you on your your uh, service. You remember getting that? Yeah, I remember that. Uh -huh. uh, Mary, I don't know if you can. Okay. Can't. We can take a picture. That thing on top yeah. zooms it in. Can you can you see that? I can see it. I can read it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here is a certificate of efficiency. Uh, to lifeboat man, what is that mm. certificate? Uh, of lifeboat that's, man. Yeah, that's the man. Uh, we were trained. That's another thing in Sheepshead Bay. We were trained. I forgot to tell you that, about how to handle a lifeboat if you're if you're going to get torpedoed or something. How to get it off and get it down in the water. 
<laughs> we also how to maintain them if, if they have any damage. Okay, now this, this is dated May 8, uh, 1944, and that's got a picture of you. Can you see that, Mary? Another thing, we can photocopy these too at the office if you yeah. want. Okay. Now, here's a certificate of service to Able Seaman. Yeah, that's, that's, that's your highest that, rank. That, that's the highest rank, yeah. And that's dated 25 May 1945. Uh-huh. That's got your picture on it. Mm -hmm. See that? Yes. Susan and a friend said they're going to try to get now, the real ones. This, this first warshipping administration uh, card, that's your Mediterranean Middle East war zone bar? Yeah, Med yeah Mediterranean. Okay. You got that? Mm hmm. And this next one is your war shipping administration for the Atlantic War Zone bar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third one is your Pacific War Zone bar. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I've asked you a lot of questions, and we've talked a lot here the, yeah. this afternoon. What, is there anything that uh, you can add, any experiences you had, or any friends you, you had that uh, served with you? Or? But one thing that sticks out in my mind, I was always afraid of height. I couldn't go any higher than that table. I still don't like height now. But when I became my first assignment, when I was able-bodied seaman, I was, uh, yeah, like I said, I was on the 12 to 4 watch, noon to 4 in the afternoon. I was having lunch around 11.30, and our boss is called the Boltson. Boltson. The Boltson? Boltson, yeah. So he tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, Smith, he said, when you, go, when you turn two, that means you go to work, uh, go up on that main mast, which is the highest thing on the ship. And there's some ropes up there twisted up. And they pull you up on a winch. They have a steam winch, a uh, cable around it. And you sit on a wooden piece of wood that big with cables. Wooden platform? Platform, yeah. It's like a swing. And you sit on there and they pull you up. <laughs> I thought, oh my, you can back no. But since I have that p the position, I can't say no because I'm that's my qualification. That's one of my jobs. So I said, what I did when he told me, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> so I went out, there's two clowns out there with this or cable, and I sat on there, they pulled me up, and then the, the, the water was calm. Thank God. <laughs> it's calm. So anyhow, I get to the top, and uh, I did the wrong thing. I looked down, and the ship rolled over, and I could see the water, but I thought, boy, if I drop, at least I'll be in the water, but I'll get drowned. <laughs> and then it came back, and went that way, and I looked down, and I thought, don't look down anymore, just do your job. and get out of here. So and then I concentrated on my job. I got it done what I was supposed to do. And I gave a signal, pulled the rope, and they, they dropped me down slow. But that's one thing I remember. Boy, that was scary. Mary, is there anything you, anything you would ask? I just enjoyed all of it. Susan? He covered everything that I knew about the times that I was asking. Now, I told my wife everything. I, we never kept any secrets. But I didn't tell her about that girl in Amsterdam wanting to come to the United States. <laughs> so, but one thing, one thing I did do, uh, I was I was an honorary person, and I had a friend. I don't know, I don't remember even who he was anymore. And I was telling him some of the stuff I did, carrying on, you know. He said, "Did you tell your wife?" I said, "No, I don't think I had to." Now this is after we were married about a year, so. He made me feel guilty, so I said, uh, one day I said, Helen, I said, I got some stuff to tell you. She said, what? And so I told her, you know, I was done, not too much drinking, a little bit, and smoke. She knew I was smoking, 
and running with women. <laughs> she knew you had some women well, in well, your life? Well, yeah. And then anyhow, she looked at me and she said, honey, she said, that's in the past. And she gave me a hug. She said, forget that and we're going to go forward together. And that's why I loved that woman because she was such an example. I mean, she was really, really an example. And uh, I thought, and what I did the rest of my married life, I just followed her. I watched what she did. And then another thing, I'll tell you a real story about Helen. Her father was in the finance. He wasn't no expert. Uh, he had a little college, but I don't know his background. And he didn't talk much. He was very quiet. But he was in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, companies like Campbell's Soup, Bethlehem Steel. I used to know them all, but I, I forget the rest of them. But he, and he said to me one day we were walking, and he was a man of few words. He said, "Don't put your money all in one basket." And I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. and anyhow, after we were married a year, I come up with an annuity, and I didn't even know what an annuity was, but I got it from Prudential, and it laid there for two or three years, and it was just a piece of paper like that. It didn't mean anything to me. And Helen said to me, "What are you going to do with that?" I said, I don't know, I never thought about it. She said, you better do something. She said, call uh, Ed, he was a broker. So I didn't answer, I just went away and I thought about that. And I thought, well, what did she say? Call Ed. So I did. And he came over, looked at it, and he said, well, you should turn this into a mutual fund. You know what a mutual fund is? I said, no, I never heard of it. So we did. and. Uh, 40 or 50 years went by and that little piece of paper turned into a fortune <laughs> because of her. Uh -huh. Because of her. Great. Great. Then we wound up with, you know, all the companies like Chevron and Apple and stuff like that. But uh, I had a broker who was not too good. He was a loser and he retired and a young kid came on. And I thought, well, he don't know anything. But boy, he turned out to be super. Mm. Oh, well, he, like, I bought some McDonald's stock and I didn't like it. I didn't like uh, Western stocks because technology is good and uh, manufacturing, oil companies. And uh, if I'd go to sell something, I'd ask this, this young guy, he's still there, his name is Ray. He said, oh no, don't do that, just leave it alone. And he's he, he's not. Most of the brokers are out to to keep trading because keep they turning, yeah. keep turning. They get commission. <clears throat> Each one's around three hundred dollars or more, depending on the size of it. But uh, this guy was just my wife and this broker was just just superb. Just really good people. Well, of all the uh, of all the places that you sailed to and all the towns you traveled to or or you had shore leave, what what was the town that you liked the best? Bahia Blanca, Argentina. Argentina? Argentina. That was nice and, and uh, I was there six weeks, that's why I liked it. And the people, the people were very courteous and it, it was clean and uh, very impressive, uh, very reasonable and very safe. Now, uh, I don't know about today, but it'd be nice to get back there and visit and I made the mistake of not getting these people's name. Right. Because I could keep it. Now I do that now when I meet people, I give them a card or get their name or get their phone number and uh, try to keep in contact. And well, Susan, Susan remember me for 20, 30, nine years. She walked into the VFW and recognized me right away. She said, you know me? I said, you're familiar, but I, I couldn't. My mind couldn't yeah. function quick enough, but Bahia Blanca was nice. And uh, was there anything about any of your bosses that uh, stands out, and, and the people that were that you were under? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. I had uh, going from right aid back. Uh, my, 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 my Jewish bosses at uh, right aid was number one. And, and then uh, well, I was with an enterprise and they treated me like a favorite son. I mean, they were, that was really good. But then go off oil, I had a boss who was alcoholic and he treated me really, really well, really well. He was 
Well, how about the Merchant Marines? Did you have anybody that uh, that stood out in your mind that was a... Uh, that one officer wanted me to become an officer. He took a, an interest in me and he thought, I, I, I probably would have been a good officer. I could have worked up to captain. But then you're out there all them months and months and you don't have any family contact and mm -hmm. I didn't like that. I, I wanted to be... I wanted to have a wife and be home. Right. Right. I'm and, still that way. And you've, you've <laughs> I like done, women. You've done very well. I'm not a womanizer, but I still, but like I, brought, I brought that up in my speech down there at the Navy. And boy, women got a, they got a kick out of that. But uh, I like men too. I had some really good close friends. There's one in, uh, Susan, Susan met him. Uh, Bill Hines, his wife passed away a couple years ago. And he's a, he has the charge of merchant marine. He's just a super nice person. His and then I have his speed. Speed, yes, speed. Yeah. Then I have a good friend in Detroit who's a recovering alcoholic, and he's a professional gambler. But oh, we're, we call one another brothers. Mm -hmm. We're so close. And then the church, I have a lot of people I'm close to. Well, what church do you belong to? Uh, it's a Presbyterian. My wife and I were brought up in the Church of God. That's from Finley, Ohio. And there's one in Anderson, Indiana, and uh, there it's a very spiritual church. But uh, we were we were here at the Church of God in Bethel Road, and a young man came in from Colorado, and he took out the piano and the organ and the hymn books. He took down the cross, and uh, oh, he changed the name. Someone said he's going to rip out the pews and the carpet. I don't know what he's going to do. What he's oh. up. But they didn't have a they didn't have a controlling uh, board. Mm -hmm. They have to have a council. And you have to have a control. The people has to have a control. Like in the United States, the people's supposed to control. Right. I don't think we do, but we're supposed right. to. Right. <laughs> well, look, I've had you here for quite a long time. I want to thank you for uh -huh. your interview. Uh, well, thank, thank you. you for your service. I appreciate this. Yeah. I appreciate meeting you okay. and what you're doing. I you're mean, doing a tremendous job. Well, thank you.